Okay, so we'll get uh, started with the teaching then. And uh, so today we're here on uh, um, Yom Kippur, and I've, I've, uh, sort of the the focus of our teaching today is how Yom Kippur uh, is really pointing towards the millennium or the thousand year reign of of Yahshua. Uh, so Almighty Father Yahweh, you know, teaches us. Uh, using his Moedim as an illustration of his plan of salvation for all of mankind. And so a lot of, you know, what we teach here, we talk about the, the Moedim and how, how the Moedim, all the appointed times, really kind of are an outline of Yahweh's plan of salvation. And each, each one we talk about, we kind of bring out how that... Uh, how that really uh, looks like for us. So we're going to start in Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. And so this is Yahweh speaking to us and telling us about how he... uh, Nothing is ever really happening by accident. And nothing just, just occurs without a reason. Everything that occurs in the history of mankind from the time of creation until Yahweh's plan is, is, uh, is finally completed is, um, is by design. It's not by accident. It doesn't ha- just happen. Yahweh is in complete control and knows exactly what he's doing. So we see this in Isaiah chapter 46 and we pick this up in verse 9. He says, remember the former events of old, for I am El, and there is no one else. Elohim, and there is no one like me. And he says here, he declares the end from the beginning, and from old, or from ancient times, uh, things which have not yet been done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and all my delight I do. So, Yahweh has a, this kind of points out, Yahweh has a very detailed, specific plan of, of how he's dealing with mankind. Nothing that's happened with, in the history of mankind has ever been a surprise, you know, or just came, oh, now what do I do? You know, so some people think that, you know, Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sin goes, Yahweh goes, oh, now that wrecks everything. What am I do now? Well, no, he knew that would happen. Of course he knew that would happen. He, you know, obviously his desire is that it wouldn't have happened. It w- you know, the desire of Yahweh would have been that Adam and Chava, you know, lived perfectly and followed his, his word and never sinned. That would have been ideal. But he knew that was really not going to happen. He, he already had a plan of how that he was going to bring all of humanity back into a relationship with him after it fell away. So today we're going to obse- we are observing uh, Yom Kippur, and as we've been commanded, and so we're going to take a look at what Yahweh is teaching us about his plan for the future, pictured in this observance. So let's go over to Leviticus, and this is where our, uh, or Wachira, Leviticus, and we're going to pick it up, uh, we're going to be in chapter 23, of course you knew we were going to go there, that's where all of the Moedim are listed, and we're going to see what the instruction here is from Almighty Father Yahweh about this day. We're going to pick this up in uh, verse 26. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 26. And he says, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh new moon is Yom HaKippurim. And it shall be a set-apart gathering for you, and you shall afflict your beings, and you shall bring an offering made by fire 
to Yahweh. And you do no work on that same day, for it is Yom Kippurim to make atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. So here we have some instructions about, um, about this day. We're here on, this is the 10th day of the 7th month. How do we know that? We started the, the uh, 7th month with sighting a new moon. We sighted a crescent moon. We didn't get, actually get to see it here in northern Wisconsin and upper Michigan, but we, we are in contact with other brethren that, um, that did see the, the moon, did see the crescent, and were reliable witnesses. So we knew that was the time that we started counting. That was day one was Yom Teruah. Now we're on day 10. It's Yom Kippurim. So that's important for us to know that we're on the right time. We're in the right place. And uh, the next thing he says in here besides, you know, when it's going to be, he says you'll have a set-apart gathering for you. Okay, so that's important. All of these Moedim, you know, are not stuff. Now, certainly t in, the, in the environment we live in, not everybody is able to gather and, and to, uh, to, um, to be able to have a set-apart gathering. Okay, but if you're, if you're capable of it, okay, he, the command is to gather together, to have a holy convocation, a whole... A, Kodesh Mikra. Um, and the, th the next thing he says is that you should afflict your being. So this is a time that we're, we're not consuming any water or food for these 24 hours. That began last night at midnight, I'm sorry, sunset, and, uh, and we'll go through the end of today until sunset. So we won't consume any water or food. And the purpose of that we're going to get into in the teaching is really help us to draw closer to Yahweh, which is really the whole point of why he set this day apart for us. And, you know, what, what, we, what we are supposed to learn from it now and what it pictures in the future. So, and also to bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. So, an offering, uh, we have been offering our sacrifices of praise and worship. Okay. Uh, this is <coughs> unlike you know, I guess some of the other assemblies that take up a, a monetary collection or, or a monetary offering, we don't do that here because, um, you know, the command is to bring an offering before him three times a year, not seven times a year. So um, when we go to the feast, when we go to Sukkot, that's the time that we bring an offering. That's a, a physical offering that we would bring. Um, so make sure you, you're prepared for that. Um, but uh, our offerings today are, are, are sacrifices of praise and worship. All right, so no work today. So all of us have, have stopped doing our normal routines, our normal uh, jobs, our normal uh, uh, way of making a living. And... Uh, <clears throat> the command here is that if any being who is not afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. So that tells us how serious this really is. This fasting part, the, the afflicting part, is not really an optional thing. Now, obviously, of course, if you have some kind of medical condition that would put your life in danger for fasting, obviously that, you know, that would, you would want to do the best you can. But for the vast majority of people, you know, this is a way for us to, to draw closer and to develop this relationship we have with Almighty Yahweh. And we should do no work in our, in our, uh, throughout our generations and through our dwellings. It's a Sabbath of rest to us, and we should afflict our beings on the ninth day of the new moon. That would have been yesterday. As the sun sets, once it, be, it sets, then we begin our fast. And uh, or we begin this observance, and we end this observance at sundown this evening. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what this really what this means. Yam ha, uh, ha kippurim is what it is in in the Hebrew, 
and it means day of the coverings, day of the coverings. It's a plural word, so there's more than one covering. It's more than, than, uh, <clears throat> than just what meets the eye here. And we're going to kind of get into a little bit more about that. So what does this word Kippur mean? Uh, if you see in the Strongs, it'll say it means atonement. Okay, mm, you know, really, what does that word mean? But that's taken from um, the root word, uh, kafar, kafar, and that means, and it's, if you like this kind of thing, it's Hebrews or H3722, Kippur is 3725, 3722 is kafar, that's the root word of where Kippur comes from, <clears throat> and it means, it means to cover, it means to uh, make a reconciliation. Um, we're going to see a couple of other places where this word is used um, that uh, it, it's, it's talking about covering something. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14. Uh, this is a command to Noah in chapter 6 when he's told build an ark, build this I want you to build this ship, build this ark. And in verse 14 it says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with a covering. Now the King James will say pitch. So they, I guess they assume that, you know, by translating it in English, they assume that it was some kind of like a tar-like substance to cover the cracks in the wood, right? So the boat, the outside of the boat was covered with some kind of material that prevented it from sinking, from prevented the water from getting in. So it covered that and basically was there to protect the people inside, the eight people inside. So that same word is used there in Genesis chapter four, uh, 6, verse 14. Another place that this word is used is Exodus in uh, Shemot. We're going to go to chapter 25. Shemot. And here we're seeing some instructions about um, about constructing this uh, piece of furniture, really, that's going to be in the the uh, the ta the uh, tent of meeting or the the tabernacle in the wilderness, and it's known as the Ark of the Covenant or the the uh, the Ark. And we see in, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 25, and we'll pick this up in verse 17, he says, And you shall make a lid of atonement, or a covering, a kafur, kippur, of covering, of clean gold, two and a half cubits long, and it's cubit and it's a half wide. So there's a covering over this box, this this ark that contains some pretty essential elements. You know, it's going to tell us that the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets that Almighty Yahweh wrote with his own finger will go inside of that. Um, later on, we're going to see that um, this book of Deuteronomy, uh, Devarim, is also going to go inside of that. Also, another thing that's going to go inside of it is um, a rod that was belonged to Aharon that budded, it budded, budded all almond blossoms. So, you know, definitely by, you know, divine revelation showing that Aharon and his sons were in fact uh, designated to be priests. 
So this lid is another thing that covers. It, it covers, and what, what's really significant about that is on this lid, it'll tell us later on that here, and uh, as we, we uh, see in verse uh, 18, and you shall make two carabim of gold, make them of beaten wood, and the two ends, uh, beaten work, sorry, and the two ends of the lid of atonement. So on each end of the lid that goes on top of the Ark of the Covenant, there's two cherubs that cover the throne of Almighty Yahweh. And the cherubim shall be spreading out their wings above the covering of the lid of atonement, their wings and their faces towards each other, the faces of the cherubim turned toward the lid of atonement. So this... Uh, this is also translated as the mercy seat. It's basically the place where Almighty Yahweh dwells, covering these artifacts or these things that, that, that really describe Yahweh's relationship with us. And so Yahweh sits there as, as a covering for us. So let's talk a little bit more about this. We're going to get into uh, an aspect of Yom Kippur that some people get a little confused about. We're going to go to Leviticus chapter 16. And in Leviticus chapter 16, we're not going to spend a, a lot of time on this because we've got an article that we've published on this and we've got a teaching on when we... If you go to YouTube and look up our, our teaching we did on uh, Aharai Moth, um, a lot of detail about this ceremony that's prescribed in Leviticus 16. But we'll just kind of summarize it. And uh, it's a ceremony that was prescribed uh, for the high priest to enter into the most holy place once per year on Yom uh, Kippurim. So... You know, the holy place is, you know, some people call it the holy of holies or the most holy place. It's the, it's the area inside of the tabernacle behind a veil that all that's in there is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the only thing in there. There's only, and no one was permitted to go in to the most holy place of the holy of holies ever except for the high priest and he could only go once a year once per year so in chapter 16 of Leviticus it describes a ceremony or uh, a sacrifice system that um, would be uh, would be performed before the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Well, before he could go in on Yom Kippur, he would perform this ceremony. So there's basically, the, uh, this, uh, the ceremony consisted of, of, of two goats. Okay? Two goats as a center offering. So before the, they could even get to the two goat process, they had a sacrifice, uh, sacrifice for the sins of the people and the sins of the high priest himself. He had to sacrifice, do a sin offering for his own sins, right? He had to uh, sacrifice a bull for his own sins. So basically there's two goats and they're brought forth before them and Yahweh would choose which goats would perform what aspect of this sacrifice. So the thing we have to keep in mind is these two goats are two aspects of the same offering, okay? They're not two different offerings. They're both together a sin offering. And because human beings are not able, really, to determine, you know, which, which one is going to do which function, that was decided by Yahweh himself. And it was decided by casting lots. They did some kind of... Uh, thing where Yahweh would make known which goat would, would do, uh, would perform uh, which aspect of this sin offering. So one goat was to be killed. 
So the lot would fall on one goat to be the sin offering, and that's the, the, the goat whose blood would be brought in to the, uh, the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. The other goat, the, the lot that would fall on the other goat, was, uh, was not to be killed, but it was to be led out into the wilderness. It was called the Azazel goat. So you'll see this in, in the King James Version. That'll be translated as scapegoat, which is a really a bad translation. It just doesn't mean that at all. The word scapegoat that we know in English now means basically someone who is, uh, pays the price for sort of an innocent person pays, um, pays a penalty for, for the sins of someone else, right? That has, that's not what's going on here with these two goats. <clears throat> what's going on here basically is these two goats represent again two aspects of the same sacrifice so the first aspect is a sin offering blood is shed to cover the sins of the nation and brought in to the holy of holies that goat is killed and that blood is brought in to and sprinkled on the the ark of the covenant the other goat is led out into the wilderness by a fit man and released. So what does that mean? So it means basically that um, the, the second aspect of that offering is that these sins are not only covered, but now they're forgotten. They're taken away uh, as far as the east is from the west. The sins are remembered no more. So let's go and see this in a couple places in scripture. Let's go to Psalm 103. <clears throat> Psalm 103. And uh, we're going to pick this up in verse 11. Speaking about Yahweh, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his loving commitment towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So, you know, how far is the east is from the west? Well, it's as far as you can possibly get, right? Because there, it's a euphemism or a... Uh, a uh, idiom meaning it's as far apart as could possibly get. Yahweh remembers those sins no more. He's and that's really what that second goat really represents. It's rem uh, talking about that uh, the sins of the nation are are covered and then removed and not remembered anymore. <clears throat> we also see this. We won't turn here, but it's Isaiah 43 verse 25. And he says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. That's Isaiah 43, verse 25. He doesn't remember those sins. He's taken them away. And that's really what that second goat really represents. And again, like I said, we've done an extensive teaching on this that really spends a whole hour talking about this particular uh, ceremony. It's the portion called Acharai Malt, and we've written an article about it. I think it's on the web page there. But these two goats are two again two aspects of the same sacrifice. One goat is killed and its blood is brought into the most holy place and sprinkled on the Ar Ark of the Covenant, specifically on the lid of atonement, also called the mercy seat. The part of the sacrifice is the goat that's kept alive. Aharon confesses the sins of the nation and puts them on the head of the live goat, which is then led into the wilderness and released. Now, you know, some, some teach, uh, you know, I, I would call it a heresy because it really is not true and really is sort of blasphemous that um, the live goat, using this word Azazel, 
in, it's incorrectly translated in English as scapegoat. And it, they'll teach that this represents Satan, represents Hasatan, being bound by an angel and confined to the bottomless pit that we see in Revelation chapter 20 in verses 2 to 3. So this word Azazel, you know, is really, we have Jewish mythology to deal with here, but the word simply means goat of departure. It doesn't, it's not a name for the enemy, it's not a name of a demon, although you'll see this in the book of Enoch, you know, some people will get this, there's an angel called a fallen angel called Azazel, and he leads a group of demons. And so that's part of where this thinking came from in, you know, sort of the post-Christian world, and that they came up with this idea that, oh, this is the angel um, putting Satan in the, in the bottomless pit is the same as this goat. Well, no, it's not. And there's a couple of reasons. Here's, I'm going to give you four, um, four reasons why this just cannot possibly be true. So hopefully get that out of your mind and just, you know, don't even consider that as, you know, any kind of doctrine that's reasonable. The first reason is that goat had to be unblemished, had to be a perfect specimen. Hasatan, the enemy, is not unblemished. He's not perfect. He's nowhere near perfect. He's no way could he possibly serve as either one of the goats. Second place, nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in anything from Genesis to, Deuteron uh, to Revelation, we ever see Satan or Hasatan ever fulfilling a sacrificial role. He never has done it. Nowhere in Scripture does it ever show that. <clears throat> so as we always pointed out, all of the sacrifices that we see in Wachira or Leviticus, the sin offering, the burnt offering, or the ascending offering, the peace offering, all of those offerings, all of them always pointed to an aspect of what Yahshua Messiah would do in the future. As we read in Hebrews, we say that these, the blood of these goats and bulls could never take away sin. It was Yahshua's blood, and we'll see that later as we go into Hebrews, but we'll, uh, those were always pointing towards Yahshua. This goat, the one that's killed, <coughs> and the one that's led into the wilderness, again, are two aspects of the same sacrifice that point towards Yahshua. Those two goats are equal and indistinguishable, right? They could not be distinguished from one another. That's why we had to cast lots to determine which one was which. Yahweh would tell us, because their human beings could not be able to determine that. <clears throat> They're chosen by lot. Hasatan is in no way equal to Yahshua representing the sacrifice goat. It's impossible. He's nowhere near equal. Even before he fell, even before, he was never equal to Yahshua. Hasatan had it in his mind, though, that he was going to be like the Most High. He was going to be like Yahweh. He was going to replace Yahweh. And, of course, that was his fall. So the third reason is those two goats are not equal. The two goats are equal and indistinguishable. Satan could not be one of them, uh, represented by one of them. And the fourth one is, this idea really came from Jewish mythology. Azazel being one of those seven fallen angels described in the heretical book of Hanach. <clears throat> so, I, just, I, I would just hope and pray for your, your own kind of peace of mind or thinking. Is just, if, when somebody mentions this, that, oh, this represents Satan, just put that out of your mind because it's not... It's not a scriptural doctrine. <clears throat> so again, there's more detail about Leviticus 16 and the two goats. Take a look at that teaching and, on YouTube if you want to learn more about it. Um, 
So now that we have some of those errors dispelled, let's take a look at what the Day of Coverings or the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur is really all about. <clears throat> so let's go to Hebrews. And again, as what we've mentioned before, Hebrews is, uh, we're not sh positive who wrote uh, Hebrews because he doesn't, the author doesn't identify himself, but um, I think you make a pretty strong argument it is Shaul, but whoever it was that wrote wrote Hebrews, he was somebody that was very, very, very learned in Torah, who understood Torah very, uh, very deep. And he was also somebody who was, um, had some pretty extensive revelation given to him. Shaul is somebody like that. <clears throat> but we're going to go to uh, chapter 9. We already read chapter 8 as sort of a lead into this during our, um, during our praise and worship here. But chapter 9, we're going to pick this up in verse 1, picking up on, on this, this idea of the covenant and identifying more about what's going on here. And remember, what, what, hap what we see in Leviticus, this is a copy and a shadow of what's in, in heaven at Yahweh's very throne, right? It's, it's not the actual thing. It's a copy and a shadow of it. So we're going to see in, in Hebrews chapter 9 about what's really, what's actually going on in heaven. And we can see this in, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go and start in verse 1. <clears throat> now the first covenant indeed had regulations of worship and earthly set-apart set place. For a tent was prepared, the first part, which was the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which called the set-apart place. We're inside of the tabernacle now, where the, the lampstand and the table and the showbread is called the set-apart place. And after the second veil, the part of the tent, which is called most set-apart, to which belong the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides of gold, which were the golden, uh, in which were the golden pot that held the manna, the rod that Aaron had budded, and the tablets of the covenant. So he's describing the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. And above it, the cherubim of esteem were overshadowing the place of atonement, also called the mercy seat, about which we do now speak in detail. These, having been prepared like this, the priests always went into the first part of the tent accomplishing their services. But in the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered first for himself, right? He had a sacrifice for, him, for his own sins. And for the sins in, of, the, uh, of ignorance of the people. The set-apart spirit signifying this that the way into the most holy place was not yet made manifest while the first tent was standing. So that's why Shaul, or the writer of Hebrews, is explaining this to people who are Torah observant, who are getting this laid out to them about how um, Yahshua fit into this picture, into what they had been doing for centuries from the tabernacle to the temple to all the to the, to this time remember the temple is still standing at this point they're still doing this after Yahshua so 40 years after Yahshua was crucified was was uh, impaled and uh, put to death the temple was still there 40 more years so there these Hebrews are still seeing this and still trying to wrap their heads around how does this all work and that's what the writer of Hebrews is helping us understand so we've had this our whole lives they're just they're just getting introduced to this and starting to get it and they're starting to understand so again the writer here says the first tent um, is a parable for the present time in which both gifts and slaughters 
are offered which are unable to perfect the one serving as to his conscience. Only as to foods and drinks and different washings and fleshly regulations imposed until a time of setting matters straight. So now he gets into the meat of it and how Messiah. But Messiah, having become a high priest of the coming good matters, through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, entered into the most holy place once for all, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, having obtained everlasting redemption. For if the blood of goats and ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the defiled, sets apart for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Messiah, who the, through the everlasting spirit, offered himself unblemished to Elohim, cleanse your conscience from dead work to serve the living Elohim. So here we see Messiah serving now as our high priest. Okay, When this was written, he was already in heaven, already serving as our high priest. He's already doing that. Even though the first temple was standing, and even though they were still going through these these uh, these uh, these rituals. The real thing that was happening was Messiah in heaven coming into the throne room of Almighty Yahweh where he abides through the, in the most holy place offering his own blood for us. So Yom Kippur pictures that step in the plan of salvation when all of mankind is finally going to be united together under the rule of Yahshua Messiah under the king of kings. But before that happens, tremendous devastation will have happened on earth. Approximately 90% of the world's population will have been killed. It's going to, you know, we, we talked about that a lot on Yom Teruah, when Yahshua returns about, you know, the day of Yahweh and this tremendous thing. We're now to the point when all of that's over. Okay, the dust is settled, the shooting stopped, Yahshua has returned, all of these armies have been defeated, and now what? Let's go to uh, let's go to uh, Revelation chapter twenty. So this brings us to that point of time here. We see this in Revelation. And we'll pick this up in verse 4. In chapter 20, verse 4. <clears throat> and I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, judgment was given to them. And the lives of those who had been beheaded because of the witness they bore to Yahshua, and because of the word of Elohim, and because of the word of Elohim, and who did not worship the beast, nor his image, and did not receive his mark upon their foreheads or upon their hands. And they lived and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. Verse 5 tells us what's going on here. It says, And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. And then it says, This is the first resurrection. So that's we already saw that happen with Yom Teruah. The saints are resurrected, come back with Yahshua Messiah. Yahshua has now established himself as the king of the earth, his ruling over the entire earth. But who are the people that these kings and priests that lived and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years, who are they ruling over? Well, it certainly isn't everybody that's dead, so there's not a, a resurrection, a general resurrection of of, of the vast majority of people, the only people that have been resurrected are the first resurrection, those who are messiahs at his return. So it's basically who, who are they ruling over? Who are they leading? Who are they guiding? Who are they teaching? Well, it's the people who lived. That 90%, I'm sorry, 10% of the world's population who survive the coming of Yahshua they survive the day of Yahweh. They survive all these plagues and these, uh, this tremendous you know, destruction that happened on the earth. 
And, you know, where are they at this point, right? Well, they're hiding, right, in caves or they're, they're somewhere. And we've we got a big job ahead of us, right? Because the world is a mess. We've got all these swords laying around, right? And they have to be beaten into plowshares. We've got all these spears that have to be made into pruning hooks. There's a lot of work to be done, and the earth has to be cleaned up. And that's what's going to happen here during this thousand years here on the earth. <clears throat> so we just want to talk a little bit about, uh, more about covering and this Yom Kippur, what it means about covering. Just, you know, so just as we have this practice and concept of covering where human, on the human and physical level, where you know we have the husband and father as a covering or kafar over his wife and children, you know that's outlined in in First Corinthians chapter eleven. We have some physical reminders of that. You know, with women cover their heads, men don't cover their heads, right? Uh, men wear zitzits. On 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 a spiritual level, now we have Yahshua as our husband and bridegroom, and Yahweh as our Almighty Father. So this ceremony also points to a time in the future when Yahshua will take us as his bride and cover and protect us. Part of building that relationship is drawing close to Yahweh so that we do, not, uh, that, we do that by afflicting our souls and how does that work? Let's just go over just a page over. If you look at uh, Revelation chapter 19, I think I got this out of, out of my, uh, yeah. Verses 6 to 9. This is the, the part where we're entering into this, this uh, intimate relationship with, with Yahshua. Revelation 19, verses 6 to 9. He says, here, um, and I heard the voice of a crowd and sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunder saying, Hallelujah, for Yahweh El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has prepared herself. And it was given to her to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the set apart ones. Blessed are those who have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the words, the true words of Elohim. So this is this beginning of the spiritual relationship. We're developing this sort of on a physical relationship now, physical plane, the best we can because, you know, we're just kind of different we're made of different components than Yahshua is now. Yahshua is spirit. We're not spirit. So we can get close, but not that close. We're going to see here how this is going to happen. <clears throat> okay, so we saw this is where the, the first resurrection said. And this covering relationship begins on the spiritual level with Yahshua and the set-apart ones and then spreads. It's going to spread to all of the people who are left alive at Yahshua's return and develops over the next thousand years. So Yahweh put into this, this concept that we're doing with Yom Kippur, they put into this concept of fasting. And this idea of afflicting our souls. And what's the point of that? Why do we do that? What's, uh, you know, as, as Yahweh just said, you know, you're, I want you to suffer. Really? No. That's not what it says. There's, you know, he gives us some very specific instruction about fasting and, and what it's supposed to do. What it really does for us. Let's go to Isaiah 58. <clears throat> so Isaiah 58 has some instructions about fasting 
about how not to do it and how to do it right. So let's go to Isaiah 58. And we're going to pick this up. We'll pick it up in verse uh, uh, 6 first. We're going to pick it up in verse 6. Because this is what Yahweh is talking, t talking to us about fasting. What it's supposed to do for us. Really, and how it develops that relationship with, with Yahweh. In verse 6, he says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loosen the tight cords of wrongness? So King James will, will uh, translate that as um, to, to release the bands of wickedness. To loosen the bands of wrongness, basically, is to help us over, overcome sin. To undo the bands of the yoke, the things that are weighing us down. What does Yahshua say about his yoke is light and easy, right? We, this fasting helps us undo the bands of that yoke to exempt the oppressed and to break off every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry that you bring it to your house to the poor who are cast out when you see the naked and cover him and hide not yourself from your own flesh? It says, if you do these things, then your light would break forth like the morning, your healing would spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The esteem of Yahweh would be your regard, uh, your rear guard. Again, he covers you, he protects you. And that's part of what, this, what Yahweh is saying about fasting. It's really an exercise to help us draw closer to him, help us bring that relationship to a more spiritual level you know, we can do this so much on a physical level. In the future, when we're connected with Yahshua as his bride, you know, of course, we'll be on a, on a much, much higher spiritual level. But this is what we can do on the physical level. The, uh, the fast that, that he has chosen. Let's see about how what he says here about what not to do. Back up a little bit here to verse 3. Actually, verse 2. It says, Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways as a nation did righteousness and did not forsake the right ruling of their Elohim. They ask me rulings of righteousness. They delight in drawing near to Elohim. And they say, why have we fasted and you have not seen? You know, what, what are they saying? Hey, pay attention to me. Right? I'm fasting. Aren't, I'm supposed to get something out of this. Wrong thinking. He's pointing out wrong thinking. Why have we afflicted our being and you took no note? Look, in the day of your fasting, you find pleasure and drive on all your laborers. You're, you're beating up your, the people that work for you, right? Driving them. Say, hey, get to work. Get busy. It says, look, you fast for strife and contention to strike with the fist of wrongness. You do not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Verse 5, is it, is, the, is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his being? You know, that's a rhetorical question Yahweh is asking you. He says, is, is that what I'm talking about? You know, the rhetorical answer is no, no, it's not. Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and spread out sackcloth and ashes? Do you call this a fast and an acceptable today to Yahweh? He's saying you're missing the point. If you're doing it like that, you're not getting the benefit. All you're doing is going hungry and thirsty. You're not really accomplishing anything. And then in verse 6 to 8 then, then he describes, this is what I'm looking for with a fast. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for you to develop this relationship with me. To look for ways that there's wickedness in you. What can we do? What am I not seeing that I need to see? What what else can I do to correct my behavior? 
and of course to reach out to other people, right? People that are hungry, people that need need things. What are we doing to love our neighbor as ourselves? Okay? Love our neighbors as ourselves. Yahshua taught us to he says to you know, he he, he put that command in a proactive Hebrew thinking kind of uh, action verb. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Which is kind of backwards from the way the Western world thinks. You know, Buddha and Confucius that say this. Do not do unto others that you would have them not do unto you. So they do that sort of, you know, in the, in the reverse thinking, don't do bad things that you wouldn't want bad things done to you. Yahshua does it, do good things. Do, you know, the actions that you're taking that are positive actions that you would want to go forth. And that's part of what fasting does for us. If we're fasting and praying and reading and studying while we're fasting uh, and worshiping, these are the things that are going to happen. In verse 8, your healing is going to uh, spring forth. Those things, light is going to break forth. So fasting is an important thing, and how it connects in with Day of Atonement and with the millennium, with looking forward to that thousand years, is this concept of, of having this relationship, or this reconciliation, this relationship with Yahshua and, uh, and one another, to be complete, to be total, to be, uh, to be, uh, you know, one. So this covering relationship begins again on the spiritual level with Yahshua. It's going to spread to all of the world. Let's go to uh, back to Isaiah, and we're going to start in uh, chapter two. Of Isaiah, and we're going to describe a little bit about how this is going to look like, and and how it's going to come about. Chapter two of Isaiah. We'll pick this up in verse uh, two. And it shall be in the latter days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh is established on top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations flow to it. So we read that. Same thing in Micha, right? Chapter 4. He says the same virtually word for word. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob. Let him teach us his ways and let us walk in his paths. For out of Zion comes forth the Torah and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations, shall reprove many peoples, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither teach battle any more. So, again, this idea of, you know, changing people who have been, you know, just think about what, at this point, the prior three and a half years that has happened, all the death and destruction, 90% of the world's population killed, all of this military equipment left over that's all there, you know, something's got to be done with it. These people who are left alive that come into the millennium, that's what they're going to be doing. Beating these swords into plowshares, turning a, a tank into, you know, something useful, a bridge or something like that. <clears throat> Let's go over a couple more pages to 11, chapter 11. And we'll pick this up in verse 2. The, uh, the spirit of Yah Yahweh shall rest upon him. Who is he talking about? Yahshua. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh, and shall make him breathe in the fear of Yahweh. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, 
But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. He shall decide with straightness for the meek ones of the earth and shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and slay the wrong with the breath of his lips. The righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and trustworthiness the girdle of his waist. <clears throat> and the wolf will dwell with the lamb and a leopard lay down with the young goat and a calf and the young kid and the fatling together and little child leads them all. And a cow and the bear shall feed their young ones lie down to, together and a lion shall eat straw like an ox. <clears throat> Nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and wean child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They do no evil, nor destroy in all my set apart mountain, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the seas. So, again, we're going to see this process happen where the very nature of animals has changed, the very nature of, of human beings are going to be, have this ability to understand Yahweh's way of life. Um, <clears throat> so this is going to happen as uh, as is pointed out in Jan Daniel chapter 2 verses 44 to 45. We're not going to go there but if you remember that's when we studied Daniel we talked about the vision that Daniel had about, you know, the, the stone being cut out without hands and smashes the image that represented basically all of the, all of the world ruling kingdoms, you know, from Babylon up to the present, uh, the time when he returns. And, and the, the stone, um, you know, lands on the feet, the feet mixed with iron and clay. That's at the end time. And he says, um, uh, this, is, this is the rain of heavens that shall be, never be destroyed, nor the rain pass over to other people, because it crushes and puts an end to all of these rains, and it shall stand forever. So all of the human governments are now, um, you know, destroyed and, and replaced by the government administered by Yahshua Messiah. Also, just go to uh, Revelation chapter 11. Again, when Yahshua returns, we hear the messenger sounding loud voices in heaven saying, the reign of this world has become the reign of our master and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. So the people that live into the millennium are going to have help to teach and guide them. So this isn't going to happen just automatically. It's not going to happen quickly. It will take a while. We're still in, in uh, Yeshayahu. Let's go over to chapter 30. And remember we talked about you know our roles as leaders and teachers, kings and priests. That's what you know, Yahweh is training us to do right now, to serve in the millennium, serve in the future to these people that need to be taught. We're going to see this in, in Isaiah chapter 30, and we'll pick this up in verse 19. He says, For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, and you shall weep no more. He shall show you much favor to you, and the sound of your cry. When he hears, he shall answer you. Though Yahweh gave you bread of adversity and water of affliction, your teachers shall no longer be hidden, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right or whenever you turn to the left. So, you know, right now we have us called out ones, the set, the set apart ones, those who are walking in this way now, we have Yahweh's Holy Spirit, we have the, the, uh, the scriptures with us to help us with this walk. Um, these people that, that are live into the millennium, they're going to have even better than that. We're going to have people basically 
resurrected saints who have been through this kind of stuff before, helping and teaching them and talking to them as they're about to make some make an error, do something wrong. We'll be there to say, this is the way, walk you in it. In addition to that, they're going to have some more help. Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 37. As this society that is now led by Yahshua Messiah in a world that does not include a... Uh, the influence of the enemy, Hasatan. We're going to go to chapter 36 of Ezekiel. Yeah, heck, Kazel. 36, chapter 36, Ezekiel. And we'll pick this up in verse 24. And he says, I shall take you from among the nations and shall scatter, gather you out of all land and you'll bring you into your own land. This is specifically talking about people that are Israelites, but it also is going to apply to everyone on the earth. And I shall sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols I cleanse you. And I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and shall give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and shall do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I shall be your Elohim. So notice we talk about this heart of stone. Heart of stone. The word stone there is, is not an accident. Of course, the, the law written on stone now it's going to be written on our hearts. Now it's going to be written on the hearts of those people who will have um, Yahweh working with them, Yahshua working with them, and all the resurrected saints working with them, helping them to, uh, to understand this way of life. Dropping down there to verse 33 says, And thus says Master Yahweh, we're still in verse, in chapter 36. Thus says Master Yahweh, On the day that I cleanse you from all your crookedness, I shall cleanse the cities to be inhabited and the ruined places to be rebuilt. All that death and destruction that happened during that, that time of the, the great tribulation, all of that stuff's got to be put back together. And the land will be, uh, that was laid waste, tilled instead of being a ruin before the eyes of all who pass by. And they shall say, this land was laid waste because has become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted and deserted, destroyed cities are now walled and inhabited. The na then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, Yahweh, have rebuilt the destroyed places and implanted what was laid waste. I, Yahweh, have spoken and shall do it. So this is going to be an example to the whole world. You know, we also see here in Zechariah chapter 14 <clears throat> that not everybody is immediately going to be able to get on board and there's probably going to be some resistance. In fact, we see that here in Zechariah chapter 14. And we'll pick this up uh, in verse 16. And it shall be that all who are left from all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall go from year to year to bow themselves to the sovereign, Yahweh of hosts, and to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. So clearly this is in the future, right? The festival of Sukkot will be kept in the future. Why wouldn't we want to do that now? <laughs> of course we're going to do it. But here in the future, you know, we're going to get some people that, you know, aren't going to quite buy into this right away, right? And it shall be... A, 
that, not, uh, that if anyone on the clans of the earth does not come up to Yerushalayim to bow himself to the sovereign, Yahweh of hosts, on them there is no rain. And if the clan of Mitzrayim, you know, Muslims in Egypt, does not come up and enter in, then there is no rain. On them is the plague on which Yahweh plagues the nations who do not come up to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. And this is the punishment of Egypt, or Mitzrayim, and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. So you think the festival of Sukkot is pretty important to be there? You know, it's not something that we want to just do in our backyard or in our living room. We've got to be there. Continuing on, we're going to go over to Jeremiah chapter 31 as we begin to wrap this up. Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu. This wouldn't be complete without talking about chapter 31. So as we go to chapter 31 in Jeremiah, he reiterates some of the same things said by Ezekiel. But we'll pick this up in verse 31. See, the days are coming. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Chapter 31, verse 31. See, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I shall make a renewed covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yahudah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day which I strengthened their hand to bring them out of the hand of Mitzrayim. Remember, we read that when we were talking, when we were reading Hebrews chapter 8. The writer of Hebrews was quoting this from Yirmiyahu. He says, My covering covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares Yahweh, I shall put my Torah, my teaching, my way of life, in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach each one his neighbor saying, and each one his brother saying, No, Yahweh, for they shall all know me, <clears throat> from the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahweh, for I shall forgive their crookednesses and remember their sin no more. So again, when we connect this with Day of Atonement, where the sin is for, you know, the... the uh, uh, the sin is covered by the blood of that goat and then remembered no more by the second goat taken out into the wilderness. So this is going to happen for a thousand years and it's going to continually, you know, improve, continually... Uh, uh, Yahweh is going. Yahshua is going to continue to 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 lead and guide and and uh, for a thousand years over the whole world. And in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, we see sort of what comes next. <clears throat> Sorry, First Corinthians chapter fifteen. This whole chapter is all about the future and about resurrection. But we come to verse uh, 23. Again, we talk about the order that this is going to be done in. <clears throat> Chapter 15, verse 23. And each in his own order. Messiah the firstfruits. Talking about resurrections. Messiah the firstfruits. Then those who are Messiah at his coming. And then the end. When he delivers up the rain to Elohim the Father... When he has brought all to naught and all rule and authority and power. So this has got to happen for the thousand years. And then after that, the second resurrection, the second general resurrection, when all people who have ever lived will again have the opportunity to have their minds opened. And then when that's all done, then... He, uh, he delivers up the rain to the Father 
when he has brought all rule and authority under power. So the last one is death. The last enemy to be brought to nothing is death. And we see that happen in Revelation chapter uh, 21, verse 4. <clears throat> we won't turn there, but it, it's just one sentence. And Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain, for the former matters have passed away. That's its point <coughs> that we'll, we'll uh, observe on the eighth day assembly. At the, after the feast is over, after Sukkot is over, we have one more Moedim, and that's the eighth day. And that'll talk about, you know, the future. All of the things that will be made new, the new heavens and the new earth. The time when Yahshua delivers the rain to the Father. So we're going to finish with John 17. And this is uh, uh, Yahshua praying uh, right before he is arrested, knowing, of course, that he's about to go through an excruciating torment and a very painful death. <coughs> He knows this, but what's on his mind right now his, uh, when this is happening? His, on his mind, he's, he's thinking ahead. He's thinking to the future. And he says here, he says, I do not pray for these alone. He's talking about just the 12 that were with him there in the garden. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those believing in me through their word. He's talking about us. He's talking about us who would believe in him from what was done and written and uh, passed down to us. <clears throat> so that they might all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they too might be one in us. So that the world might believe that you have sent me. And the esteem which you gave me, I have given them so that they might be one as we are one. That idea of achad, perfectly united, perfectly joined together. I in them, you in me, so that they might be perfected into one, so that the world knows that you have sent me and have loved them as you loved me. You know, think about that. <clears throat> Yahweh loves us. As much as he loved his very own son, the one that had been with him for ever before, he loves us that much. He says, Father, I desire that those whom you have given me might be with me where I am, so that they see my esteem which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, indeed the world did not know you, but I knew you, and those who knew that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and shall make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me might be in them, and I in them. So Yahshua is just in his very last few breaths, as he's contemplating, he's getting you know, preparing himself to go through this tremendous ordeal is thinking about us being united with Almighty Father Yahweh, with him and Yahweh, and together. And that's really what the millennium is, is that thousand-year reign is really working on, is bringing all of these people who have not known Yahweh and have and survived through this this terrible ordeal and will be uh, be taught and led by us who are being taught and led by Yahshua. So, I will end the teaching there. I hope this has been a blessing for you. I hope... Uh, hmm? I hope this has been something that uh, you would find valuable.